would, would refer to it. And if you were to land on the runway, you come off the plane, uh, planes in Gibraltar don't pull up to the terminal, you walk off the stairs and walk into the terminal. And it's just a constant situation of people bumping into each other because you come off the plane and there's your view. And it's one of the best uh, views of the rock that I've been able to see. And this is, this is one I took on my uh, first flight into Gibraltar, a cloudy day like you had yesterday morning. But I, now I need you all to go home and tell all your friends to do this cruise when we offer it again so I can fly back into Gibraltar. Because it was a little bittersweet for me as I was on the deck watching the rock disappear into the night as we pulled away last night. Because this was one of the more fascinating places to do business. And maybe Albania is the only place that was a little stranger uh, to do business in recent years. But I worked with this guy, Carl Massilio, to get all the touring and all the buses and everything set up. But we're always looking to find that extra World War II expert, the thing that the other buses you see roaming around won't have. And that was Pete Jackson. So I find him by looking at the Gibraltar newspaper and just searching World War II topics. Because in a place as small as Gibraltar, they probably have a go-to guy, a go-to expert. And so I look in the papers, and he seems to be the one quoted about every restoration project or every so-and-so is going to visit the rock and talk to Pete Jackson about the, the one-ton gun project or whatever, some funder or the raising money. But then I have to go and find YouTube clips because not everybody who gives interviews to papers can speak to a group. And uh, so I did that. I looked at that. and So I called Carl, and Carl's the kind of guy that when I'm not talking to him, he wants to pull his phone out and say, oh, I'm going to get you this, I'm going to get you this, oh, my sister this, my cousin this, oh, my, my second cousin's the port agent, we got this, oh, don't worry, don't you worry, it's all covered. So I'm looking up Pete Jackson stuff, I find the YouTube, I call Carl, and I say, Carl, do you know Peter Jackson? He goes, I know Pete Jackson, you're getting Pete Jackson, and then he hangs up. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, then we got Peter Jackson, and, and there's no man who's been in the tunnels uh, for longer durations than him in terms of trying to map out it and find where these things are. So um, it's a little bittersweet, but I want to fly back to Gibraltar, so you got to tell your friends to do this cruise the next time we offer it, so that can, um, I get the right word here, uh, support my next trips into Gibraltar <laughs> by air, so I can eventually get one with a blue sky uh, as I land. So um, I'm going to have some announcements about the Valencia touring and uh, the next days after the talk, so just to where you're supposed to meet tomorrow, the timing, how much walking, all that kind of stuff. So uh, stick around when these guys get done. But today's topic is going to transition us from Gibraltar to that place up north of it called Spain. And we'll transition to uh, the Spanish part, give you a preview of what you're gonna be dealing with on the Spanish Civil War on your excursion. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Don, uh, Mike, and Rich. Well, that was my introduction. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to try to bring this thing together today, a little, some integration, and try to make sense out of it, frame it, and then move us forward to the, uh, although we're going back in time, uh, to the uh, Spanish Civil War. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, I've had fitful nights of sleep here. I get up at 3.30 and I thought, you know, I think we'll do today. Um, we'll do this like we're making a movie, okay? And the movie is uh, it's a Steven Spielberg production, okay? So it's a drama. Uh, we want to try to build in fidelity, uh, true to what actually happened. We want to bring in contingency. We want to bring in movement, suspense. In other words, try to get it just as it was. And um, so, um, We'll have a cast of characters. Our chief characters will be Churchill, Hitler, and Franco, okay? So it's about the big guys rather than the little people. And um, we're gonna start uh, in uh, July 1940, okay? Um, France has fallen, and um, Vichy's been installed, and uh, what's, what's next? Also, very recently, 1939, uh, the Nationalists have crushed the Republicans around uh, Barcelona. It's all over. The Brigaders have gone home, uh, and Spain's going back to a repressive regime. It's a fascist country, okay, like its neighbor, Portugal. And um, so, you're in London, 
So we'll go from we'll go to Washington, we'll go to Berlin, um, we'll go to London, and um, there were in possibly Paris, and they will be you know, our major some of our major touch points, and then of course we'll do Madrid with Franco. Now. Um, Spielberg's theory of filming is, is kind of interesting. It, it, it's based on the old biblical um, story of Joseph and his coat of many colors. Joseph's brothers throw him in a pit, and then he has to get out of it. He's a sympathetic character, and he kind of root for him. And he argues that almost every one of his films, from Schindler's List on down, is about people who an audience can not only empathize with, but sympathize with and try to get them in an almost impossible situation um, and then watch them with a lot of it. Um, well, Churchill was in a very, very difficult position in, uh, in July of uh, 40, uh, 1940. He knew that the next move, he's trying to get, you know, he, see, Churchill has just, it's a new government, and um, England has been in an entirely reactive situation. They react to what Hitler does. Um, Hitler agrees to meet Munich, and they succumbed and uh, hand over to him uh, eventually uh, in entire Czechoslovakia, etc. Uh, so, um, and Churchill is not the kind of man that likes to be in a reactive situation. He wants to somehow take it to the enemy. But he's got a problem, because he knows, as he points out in his famous quote, that the Battle of France is over, the Battle of Britain has begun. And so it began that month, okay? As the Luftwaffe ramps up and the Kriegsmarine ramp up for Sea Lion, the invasion of England. So he's got to defend uh, the, the mother country. And uh, that's his charge. But what about the empire? And uh, which is dear to the heart of Winnie. And um, what does he do with the empire? Does he try, does he send troops to the Mediterranean, which is the keystone of his empire, at least in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, does he stock up entirely and mobilize for the expected invasion of England? Uh, and even the public's not united on, on this position. Well, Churchill wants to do both. Um, he wants to protect the empire. He needs to protect the empire, he feels. And of course, he needs to save England. So what does he do? And that very month, when he has to make these kinds of decisions and present them to Commons, his intelligence service picks up a dispatch, um, and um, they're reading, you know, reading the, uh, the, you know, the, the traffic, and uh, the German spy master Admiral Canaris uh, is in Madrid, and he's meeting with Franco. Uh oh. The fascists are talking. What's going to happen down in the Mediterranean? What about Gibraltar? And from Gibraltar, what about those pillars that we talked about across the Mediterranean? Um, uh, culminating, of course, in um, Suez. Uh, the Suez Canal was completed in 1869, and Britain has been controlling it almost since the stock company finished the construction. So he has to think about all of these sorts of things and, and, and how to defend. Um, the uh, Malta is particularly uh, 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 a particularly acute dilemma because the army wants to abandon Malta. They think it is utterly indefensible. They have six or seven biplanes on Malta. That's their airports. <coughs> And only three of them at a time can be airborne because of the gas shortage. They call those planes Faith, Hope, and Charity. And that was it. Uh, there's a very small garrison in Malta. And Malta, of course, is the pivot of the Mediterranean. It's right in the middle of there. Um, they're going to bring supplies, troops, things, the stopover point, refueling, refitting, things like that, to Egypt. Um, Churchill and Admiral Cunningham uh, who's in charge of the fleet, the British fleet in the Mediterranean, they want to save Malta, and they overrule the army. And one dilemma here is that Malta is strategically situated beautifully for the British, except for one thing. It's situated beautifully 
for um, the fascists, namely Mussolini, who's a minor character in this. Uh, it's only 90 miles from Sicily, and it can be bombed. And it was bombed incessantly. It was the most bombed city in World War II. Second was Cologne. Um, over 400 bomb raids on Malta during the war. They went into tunnel on Malta as well, and they went, weren't as well constructed as these that we saw uh, yesterday. So, um, what does Churchill do? And he, again, is thrown into a reactive situation because he has to respond to what his intelligence is telling him that they're talking about taking Gibraltar. And Franco, in this conference with Canaris, agrees to allow German scouts um, surveyors, engineers, to scout out Gibraltar. And uh, he has them penetrate Gibraltar. He has them scout from the heights overlooking Gibraltar, which the harbor can be clearly seen from Spain, from high points in Spain, um, with no more simple an instrument than a telescope, okay, or binoculars. Uh, and that's all he'll allow for now. Um, he's resistant to allowing Hitler to, uh, to come through the country. But Churchill doesn't know this yet. Doesn't know this yet. So what does he do? Anybody have any ideas? Where do we go next in our film? What do you think? What would you do? What's that? It's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. Uh, the bombers are in formation, flying toward the south of England, and he's in this seemingly impossible situation. Well, he did get out of it, right? So how does he get out of it? What are you going to do in the Mediterranean to protect Gibraltar? Does Gibraltar have a strength, aside from its geography? All of a sudden, its geography, which had been paramount and important, sitting right on the Straits of Gibraltar, nine miles wide, okay, it's the entranceway from the, uh, coming from the Atlantic into the, uh, into the Mediterranean. But its weakness now is that hovering above it is a potentially hostile uh, nation. Um, why do you think, let me put the question differently, why do you think, let's get ahead a little bit, why do you think Franco, we touched on this a little bit before, why didn't Franco go along with the pressure from Germany and allow Hitler to march an army through the country? See, what the Germans did with the scouting report came back saying is that the winds are too high. These are the German scouts, and they, Canaris' boys, and they come back with the SA, and they come back and tell him, and it goes on to the Fuhrer, it goes from Gehring to the Fuhrer, um, to attempt what Hitler initially wanted to do, a parachute landing, um, would be precarious, radically precarious, because of those rock formations created, you know, uh, capricious winds and heavy currents, uh, so maybe not a parachute operation. He doesn't have the Navy to do an, you know, an effective amphibious invasion. Uh, so what he's going to try to do, that's why what he was going to try to do was, so Hitler said, we've got to somehow work a deal with Franco. We've got to put pressure on him. What kind of pressure points did they have over Franco? I'm sorry? Absolutely. Food? Food. Food. Now, suppose... Suppose Franco goes along with Hitler and agrees to allow the Wehrmacht to march through the country and set up artillery emplacements on the cliffs overlooking Gibraltar. Uh, you can see right up there at the top. Okay. Suppose he goes along with that. And suppose he goes along with his alternative plan when he jettisoned the parachute operation. He sends his, a very crack mountain regiment, 98th Mountain Regiment that he had, Native Bavarian and Austrian troops, and uh, goes in 
and they land engineers, and they land a, a small amphibious force, and with heavy artillery and incessant bombing um, by Heinkels and Stukas, that they can drive, knock, knock out the fleet, but perhaps drive the fleet away from the coast of Gibraltar and invade like that. So that's the, the secondary plan that they eventually go, to go down to. And this plan is concocted by the generals who are planning the invasion of England. But the Navy, the German Navy, is unsure about this plan. Okay. And this Spanish plan is put together and drafted as an alternative to the invasion if Hitler calls it off, or if it fails. That's what Hitler agreed would be the next move. And late in the war, he said, not moving in that direction, not pressuring Franco, uh, was one of the largest mistakes he made. He actually admitted it, and Goering seconded him. He said, um, the, um, I have a quote here from Da Fuhr. Um, let's start with Hitler. We ought to have attacked Gibraltar in the summer of 40 immediately after the defeat of Franco. Here's Gary. He's talking to a British diplomat. Hitler's greatest mistake was a failure to march through Spain with or without Franco's assent to capture Gibraltar and spill into Africa. This could have very easily been done and it would have altered the whole course of the war. The loss of Gibraltar might have induced England to sue for peace. Failure to carry out the plan was one of the major mistakes of the war. Very prominent British historian Hugh Trevor Roper seconded that. He believed Hitler would have, should have, defeated Franco, taken Gibraltar, and Germanized Spain before he went into Russia. Had he done that, had he clinched the West, those are Roper's terms, uh, by taking Gibraltar in 40, he, he probably would have won the war in the West and probably would have taken Russia. What does Churchill think later on in retrospect? Let's take him from the point where he has to make a decision to the point when it's all done. Um, it seems certain, he said, in 19, June 1940, that Spain would join the Axis in the war against Great Britain. The Germans would then have undertaken the seizure of Gibraltar, which would have, been hand, would have been handed back to a Germanized Spain. If Spain had yielded to German blandishments and the pressure, the burden would have been very heavy indeed. The Straits of Gibraltar would have been closed, and all access to Malta would have been cut off from the west. All the Spanish coast would have become a nesting place of German U-boats. England may have survived, but at a far greater cost than it paid in blood and treasure. So that's Hitler's assessment of that. And that doesn't get into too many textbooks, um, which move you quickly to the main event, uh, which is not in our chronology, by the way, to the main event uh, that July and August, which is the Battle of Britain. Okay, and. Uh, they pass by this, just as before Mike and, you know, got on this, you know, the idea of doing a book on Vichy. Vichy was kind of, eh, you know, sidebar stuff, sidebar stuff. And all of a sudden it turns out to be center stage, center stage. And this, to Churchill, is center stage. In Washington, with Leahy and people like that, this is center stage as well. Um, losing the Mediterranean. This is not, you know, a B-League theater. This all of a sudden becomes an A-League theater, okay? Losing, because Gibraltar falls, there goes the Suez Canal. Yeah. And, and you have what maybe Mussolini, Mussolini's dream being fulfilled of turning the Mediterranean into an Italian lake and building the empire around it, you know? So you, you gave me a couple answers. So what, what other kinds of pressures could Hitler have? No, let, let's put it this way. Why doesn't Franco succumb? 
See, Franco, in a funny way, becomes a hero of this drama because the fascist doesn't bow to the fascist. You see? Why not? He'll never get it back. He'll never get it back. He knows, he knows what happened to Czechoslovakia. He knows what happened to Austria, okay? Take a little bite out of the Sudeten, take the whole country. He knows it. He's seen, and it threw fear in his heart. These are wily politicians. Hitler, for example, in the Spanish Civil War, didn't want the nationalists to win decisively. His argument was, let them win, yes, let them be winning, but have this war go on incessantly, and we have the chaos that we want to be able to take over the country. That's the way he's thinking. He doesn't trust Franco. Franco doesn't trust him. So that's one reason, an excellent reason. Any other reasons Franco wouldn't succumb? How about the food thing you talked about? We were kind of paying, paying. Absolutely, the grain thing you know, that Mike and I were talking about. He, this is why the Spanish Civil War is, for a hundred other reasons, very important. Because an already, already, well, first of all, why do you have a revolution? You don't have many revolutions in prosperous capitalist countries, okay? This is a, a semi feudal country that was poor before the Republicans took power, and it was poor afterwards. And it was desperately poor, and it was decimated by one of the most viciously fought wars in all of history. I mean, you talk about blood wars, like you had in the Soviet Union. Spain was a blood war. Like Mike said yesterday, why? Because it's a war of ideas. Catholicism versus atheism in the eyes of the Spanish. Destructions of churches, burning and, and arson, convents, nuns taken out and slaughtered, okay, uh, by the Republicans, all right? The opposite, Franco comes back with extreme brutality, Guernica, which Richard's gonna talk about in a second. So this is an incredible, it, it, it's a war, like I said the other day, when I, you know, my <laughs> Republicans returned to Spain and went into that bar, went into that uh, housing complex I told you about, it, it still lives in Spain. People still talk about it. They talk about it. The church, you know, especially is important in this. The military, uh, you're fighting against, uh, you know, a feudal regime. So it's, it's a country that is in horrible condition and needed food, and it's getting it from the United States. Thanks largely, I think, to Harold Hickey's, okay? Secretary of the Interior. So that's another reason. And the other reason, somebody like Franco wouldn't succumb to this situation and give in to Germany, because Hitler added a little spice to the deal. Remember we said yesterday, one reason Franco wasn't gonna move was because he feared that England would attack the Canary Islands. Mm -hmm. Churchill says, okay, Churchill you know, reassures him of that. Hitler comes back with the idea that we'll defend the Canaries with you. Okay. Don't worry about England. Second little spice to the deal. You can take Gibraltar. It'll be Spain's. Now, Franco doesn't believe this, <laughs> but it's offered. It's offered. Nor did Hitler believe it, but it's out on the table. So, with that kind of push, carrot stick, um, Hitler has, he's not sanguine, but he has some hope that this wily dictator, who's a lot craftier than Hitler thought he was, and a lot stronger uh, psychologically than Hitler thought he was, uh, isn't, gonna, isn't gonna give in. He thought this was gonna be another Austria. Bring the premier in the room, and two hours later, you have Austria. Yeah. Would there be any other reasons why you could, uh, uh, Franco would not succumb to, uh, Hitler's blandishments. Maybe you like this. Well, you know, it goes back again to a point that Mike was making. There are all kinds of different fascists. And Franco wasn't the kind of fascist that Hitler was. He didn't have a racial program, okay? And, um, and Franco's not doing to the Catholics what Hitler did to the Jews, okay? 
and Hitler knows the consequences of even aligning with a regime like this. Aligning with a regime like this. So all this is floating in the air. Um, this is what, you know, an overused word in the news today is this is an existential moment. Spoken mostly by people who have no goddamn idea what existentialism is. <laughs> okay? And existentialism is about choice. You are the product of the decisions that you make, not of any innate nature or any soul or any you know, ultra spirit or anything like that. Uh, look at the movie we saw. Everybody goes to Rick's, but everybody that goes to Rick's have to, has to make a decision. That's an existential film if there ever was one. And Hemingway's writing existential novels about kind of making decisions like this. He has to make a decision when he's in Spain whether to, which side of the Republican cause he's going to support the anarchists, which he, which he rejected, and even sanctioned, in a sense, in his writings, mutedly but sometimes overtly, the assassination of anarchists, as George Orwell points out in the best book ever written about the war, Homage to Catalonia. Um, and he sides with the Russians, not because he's a communist, he's an individualist and a capitalist. Um, but he buys the dream that Spain's a democracy and he's there with the brigaders to defend it. And his character, in For Whom the Bell Tolls, dies. He's a demolition expert, and he, and he dies destroying a bridge in, in, you know, and just before the Guardia Seville and the Spanish army arrive. So he's making, Hemingway has his characters making these kinds of choices in his, um, in his work. That's one of the reasons I gave you as a reading the conflicted nature of the struggle. Two accounts from the same book, From the Bell Told. One about incredible incredible violence committed against the citizenry by the fascists, and another one about hair-raising violence committed by the Republicans against the nationalists. Hemingway supported the communists for one simple reason. The Russians didn't have a lot of troops in Spain. They had very few. Mussolini provided most of the outside troops. Uh, what he provided were advisors, commissars, political officers, who directed the nationalist cause. Okay. And um, so, you know, the, the Russians are involved in, in, in that respect, in that respect in, in, in Spain. And he says, they have the discipline, the anarchists don't, to win the war. And the war has to be won. Churchill's thinking after the same thing. He, you know, what, what's most important, winning the war. Um, so, these are the decisions that were in front of the leaders at the time, we know what decisions they made. We know Churchill will fight a battle for the Mediterranean. We know the, the, he'll align with the Americans after Pearl Harbor. We know they're going to land at Torch. We know they're going to move on to Husky, to Italy. We know the invasions are going to be mounted largely from Malta of southern France. And we know the finish up is going to be in northern Italy at the Gothic Line. We know all that now. That's our trip. So what I thought I'd do at this point, when you have these alternatives in front of you, and you see what the outcomes of the decisions, the existential decisions that these people had to make, I thought we'd open it up to our other panelists and for the rest of the session and to the audience and bring you in with your questions on what you've seen at Gibraltar, what you've seen, you know, uh, and, and taken from, from Mike's compelling accounts of Vichy, from your own observations of Gibraltar, et cetera. So let me throw it open to the room. Did you, did you want to do uh, Guernica first, sir? Yeah, why don't we do Guernica first? Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Go ahead, Rich. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to just set this up in terms of the significance of Guernica. And Mike's going to talk a little more specifically about the details of it. But what you have to understand is as soon as airplanes were made, uh, people began thinking about what you could do militarily with them. And very early on, uh, before World War I, uh, the very first individual who sat down and wrote out on a piece of paper the idea that eventually aircraft could be used to bomb the civilian population of a nation, shatter the morale and conquer the nation by air power alone, was uh, a fellow named Nakajima in Japan. 
Other people may have had the thought, but he actually put it to paper. Ned Wilmot uh, found for it. After World War I uh, and air power matured uh, in the 1920s, there was a whole spate of literature, uh, famously by a fellow named Duhai, Dubey, about the prospect of a future war would be a war that leaped over the battlefield that they'd seen in World War I of all the slaughter in the trenches, and it would be an air power strike against the civilian populations. Uh, and she's not only with bombs, but with poison gas. And it was a very terrifying vision that that, that would be the character of the coming war. Harold Macmillan, uh, who of course later became a British Prime Minister, was a very significant uh, political figure during the war. Uh, he would say later that you have to understand, as he said in, about the, in the 1950s, that the way people in the 1930s looked at the prospect of cities being bombed was at the same level of terror that we've lived under now under the nuclear cloud. That's how severe it was. So in 1932, the Japanese uh, is a sort of a side uh, residual of the campaign in Manchuria. There's a small battle waged in the city of Shanghai that goes on for several months. And during that period, uh, the Japanese air aircraft, uh, mostly naval aircraft, uh, will bomb Shanghai very extensively and kill somewhere between 2,000 and possibly as many as 6,000 Chinese civilians. And this is the first uh, real instance in which there is mass uh, killing on a very, very large scale of civilians by air power. There were some episodes during World War I that are much lesser in comparison to what goes on at Shanghai. Uh, and this is also the moment when uh, there's this effort in counter to this theory about mass civilian bombing uh, as being a feature of the next war. There was an effort by both uh, legal stricture and moral suasion to prevent that from happening. The legal stricture never uh, was in place. There was, never was any uh, legal uh, restriction on the use of air power against cities that was enacted and agreed to in the interwar period. Uh, the closest thing was an analogy to naval bombardment of cities, and that had the loophole that if the city was, quote, defended shore batteries and apparently any aircraft batteries, that made it a legitimate target regardless of any other feature. So you had this episode, which the Chinese are very aware of, of uh, this major episode in Shanghai, which well preceded uh, Guernica. Uh, yet Guernica became the great symbol of air bombing of civilians. And it was both the episode itself and, of course, the very famous painting by Picasso. So Mike, you want to tell us about the details? Actually, I think I might take a page from Don's book here and, and take us back for another scene in London, but, but maybe move the scene a little bit from Number 10 Downing Street, the residence of the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and walk you down, I don't know, half a mile or so to a place called Carlton Gardens, which is a beautiful building near, near Buckingham Palace that they had given to Charles de Gaulle. And de Gaulle is sitting there in July 1940, August 1940, when he receives a message from a man named Félix Eboué, who is the first African-born colonial governor of a French territory. And he controls what we would today call the Central African Republic. He tells de Gaulle, if you can send some men and troops, if you need some weapons, some troops, something out here, I'll be the first governor of a French province to renounce Vichy and declare for Charles de Gaulle. I'll declare for free France. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because the Central African Republic, what which they call the Central African Republic, sits just to the west of Ethiopia, which is of course controlled by Mussolini. And Ethiopia controls the waters of the Nile River and the southern access to Egypt and the Suez Canal. So for Winston Churchill, this is critical, critical territory on the other side of the Mediterranean to Suez. What Churchill is worried about he knows that in the 1930s, the British Army has spent most of its time, Montgomery, others were there, fighting Arab revolts in Palestine. He also knows that although the British control Egypt, the British are not popular in Egypt. So an Arab uprising in Palestine and Egypt, the Italians controlling Ethiopia, and Vichy France controlling most of the French Empire in Africa, could threaten the Suez Canal on the other end of the Mediterranean. So, even though Churchill and his foreign minister, Anthony Eden, think that that man, Charles de Gaulle, might well be insane, 
they recognize that in this case, their strategic interests overlap perfectly. So de Gaulle goes to Churchill and says, we have to explore this. Félix Eboué is about to declare part of the empire for free France. That's an enormous statement, not just of strategy, but of ideology. A part of the empire wants to be free. So the British and French worked together to put together a very high-level delegation. Eden himself went, Archibald Wavell, who was the commander in Cairo, went, a man named René Plevin, who later became Prime Minister of France and later won a Nobel Peace Prize, goes on this mission, and a man named Philippe Leclerc goes on this mission, who later becomes one of the senior French commanders. He'll lead the armored division that liberates Paris. In my mind, the great unknown, unappreciated hero of the Second World War everywhere outside France. No one knows who Philippe Leclerc is unless you're French. Um, well, historians know. Yeah, we know. We know. Um, we know everything. We know everything. Yeah, we're, we're never wrong. Uh, I've never made a mistake. Never made a mistake. So this free French-British team comes up. They assemble an army from literally all over the world. So there's a group of South African Jews who join. There's a group that comes from India. There's an air contingent that comes over from India. And they conduct a remarkably successful campaign in Ethiopia. And they do it in part because the goal of the operation is not to add Ethiopia to the British or French empires. The goal is to put Emperor Haile Selassie back on his throne. Backstory of which I'm happy to talk to anybody if they're, if they're interested. And they do it, and it works. So not only does Ethiopia become pro-ally under the rule of Haile Selassie, on the other end of Ethiopia, on the Red Sea, French Somaliland, what we now call Djibouti, they overthrow their Vichy French governor, and a free French guy comes in, and that's important because it means that the Red Sea is now safe enough for Franklin Roosevelt to say it's okay to put Lend-Lease convoys through there. Right? Again, as Don said, Vichy connects to everything. And you know, it's, you think about the fears that are in people's dancing in people's minds, although they seem to, seem to us today inconceivable. The fact that, again, the Japanese coming around the Indian Ocean and up the Suez and joining in with the Germans in the Mediterranean and closing it. We'll close it from Gibraltar and we'll put the cork in at Suez. And, and Charles British, de Gaulle the, stops it from happening. Yeah. So the reason I'm telling you this is really, I think, threefold. And then I'll stop talking and get to your questions. The first is, we know that's a difficult man, Charles de Gaulle. We know, and I can talk more about why he's such a difficult guy when we get on the beaches in France. But from the beginning, Charles de Gaulle and Winston Churchill have a strategic interest in common that the Americans don't have with de Gaulle. And that's important. Second thing, I'm retelling you this, that man Philippe Leclerc now helps to get free French movements in other parts of the French Empire. So that there becomes this idea, the free French idea is not just Charles de Gaulle's voice from Carlton Gardens on the BBC, it's now an army. It's now a physical force, and that's very important for the way that things are going to uh, play out here at Operation Dragoon. And the third reason I'm telling you just left my jet lag brain, but it will come back to me. <laughs> I got it. I got it. The third reason that's important is, as we'll see, the operational planning as we start to move towards Dragoon, as we start to think about how this is going to go, that dimension is critically important that this is gonna have a French stamp on it. We're gonna liberate the empire first, then we're gonna to go to Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. Remember, Algeria is part of France, it's not part of the empire. And then we're gonna go and liberate metropolitan France. And when we get to Corsica, which most people associate with Napoleon, there's a free French Charles de Gaulle connection to this as well, that we'll talk about when we get there. So I'm just gonna finish with this by saying that a couple of years ago, right before COVID, I had the phenomenal opportunity to go with an Army War College group to Ethiopia. I got to teach this campaign to the Ethiopian War College because Ethiopia did not teach it when it was run by the communists. They ignored it. And we took a, we hired this crazy driver, Sammy, and we went up into the mountains above Addis Ababa, which is where the battlefield, the last battle was, and where there's a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery, an Italian War Cemetery, and a Free French War Cemetery all next to each other. And the names on the graves are from all over the world, right? An example of the way that this is, again, an ideological war. Jews coming from South Africa to Ethiopia to fight. 
right? All as part of this ideological engagement. So again, as we've been talking about, everything connects to everything else. And again, as Don has been kind enough to point out, in my view, it all comes back to Vichy at the center. So I'll stop there. No, you're not. <laughs> I want you to explain you something bomb, else. You've got a bomb Guernica. I, I got a bomb no, 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 I, want, I want you to explain something else. You know how sometimes you have the puzzle all completed and it's just one, two, three, four more pieces? You had the pieces in your hand, you kind of knew what happened. Mike has already talked about a big in engagement in, in a place near Iran. And here Churchill, the precipitate to this is Churchill has to make a decision of what to do with the French fleet. And why don't you put that final piece in there? Sure, Iran, Iran is on that map. Um, it's the second arrow from the right. Um, next to Iran is a, um, a naval base called Mers el Kabir, right, right next to Iran. That's where the largest, uh, the largest part of the French fleet's in Toulon, which we're gonna visit. The second largest part is here in Oran. Again, the question of this is, the French fleet responds to Vichy, it answers to Vichy. Vichy is technically a neutral country. Admiral Darlon, the commander of the, the Vichy French Armed Forces, had made, issued two orders, one of which I find absolutely fascinating. Marty, the Admiral, I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, but the first order is, the French fleet will never be commanded by anybody who's not French. And if anybody tries to attack it, German, Italian, American, it will fight back. The second order is the incredible one in my mind. He says, the first order stands even if I personally revoke the second order in writing. In other words, if I'm ever coerced, if a German or Britain or somebody forces me to revoke that, that order, ignore it. The fleet's either French or sink it. Right, scuttle it, which is what they'll do in Toulon Harbor, which we'll see here in a couple days in a, after after Operation Torch. But to get back to Don's point, so that that fleet is sitting there at Mers El Kabir. You can see from the geographic location, it can attack Gibraltar, it can pressure Malta, it could even start to work its way east. Churchill knew that Darlan had said it'll stay neutral and it will stay in the port. Nevertheless, he didn't trust it. Good so reason. for good reason. <laughs> There's a, this is a constant discussion I have with my British and French colleagues. Every Briton I know says this was the right thing to do even though it was a terrible decision. Every French person I know says this is the war, you, you attacked a neutral fleet sitting in port that was not in a position to defend itself. Anyway, here's what happens. From Gibraltar, a fleet force called Force H goes down to Mers el Kabir, blockades, that is, holds the French fleet in port, and says to the French fleet, you have three choices. You can surrender and come with us to England where we'll disarm the ships and keep them in England for the course of the war. You can join us or you can sail your fleet to the Caribbean. You can do one of those three things and you have like two hours to make a decision because nightfall is coming. The commander of the British fleet did not want to do this. He hated the very idea of what he was about to do. He said it was the most odious decision. Most odious decision of his career, right? French fleet did not respond, but it did send out a signal to Toulon saying, hey, we're trapped here. If you guys can send anything to help us, we'd really appreciate that. The British fleet intercepts that, and Somerville regretfully orders this attack on Mers el Kabir, killing 1,200 Frenchmen, which Darlan points out was more Frenchmen than the British had killed Germans up to this part of the war. The French ambassador went to President Roosevelt and said, this is an attack on a neutral state you need to condemn it. And Roosevelt says to him, if I were Mr. Churchill, I might have made the same decision. And the reaction in the United States is this is a tragedy that it happened, but it's a couple less capital ships we now need to worry about. Now just, we'll, we'll talk about this again in too long, but, but this drives Darlan, who already hated the British, this drives him into a fury. And the French did order an air raid over Gibraltar in response to this. Because that's where the fleet sailed out from. That's where the sea fleet sailed out from. Full circle. And it's also, <laughs> and my guess is it's also the only part, I mean, it is the only part of Britain that, that you can get to from Oran. Um, so it, it's an, a major, major, major big deal. And Darlan, who we'll talk much more about, I, I hope, uh, Darlan at, requested, when I die, which he figured would be sooner rather than later, for reasons I'll also explain, he requested to be buried with his sailors in Mers el Kabir, which is where he is today. And it's good that he died sooner rather than later, but we'll get to that. So meanwhile, you've been hearing the droning of these bombers heading for Guernica, and you want to hear the story there. Uh, 
This became an enormous symbol of the bombing of cities in the original versions of what happened, the death toll. Utica was an extremely important Basque city. It was also important as a transportation uh, uh, hub for uh, the front in that area, which was the tactical reason why the Germans decided to bomb it. The bombing took place. The original uh, accounts of this depicted as uh, this uh, cataclysm in which I think it's about 18 or 1900 people are killed. Uh, the that was the original story. Yeah, the original. They figure now they put usually around 300, something like that. Uh, it occasioned this famous painting by uh, Picasso, which became sort of symbol the symbolic value of this was just enormous. Uh, as the war plays out, what you're going to see is that you know, as the axis uh, sowed, so they shall reap. And the notion that they have trampled down uh, all these restrictions uh, is a phrase that used to be used called the laws and customs of war. So you have the codified law of war, whatever it happens to be at that time. And there's also what's called the customs, what has become accepted as acceptable in terms of making war. And in the 1930s, Guernica, Shanghai, that's where the notion that, OK, unleashing massive aerial firepower against huge urban areas packed with civilians is a yeah. fully acceptable custom of war. And this will then reap on through the period until in the great cataclysm between 43 and 45, when the Allies now have massive bomber fleets, you're going to get Hamburg and Dresden and Tokyo and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If you ever get the chance to go to Guernica, it's beautiful. It's the capital of Basque country up in the northeast. Um, and one of the reasons it's targeted, um, Spain, Spain is much smaller than the United States, but as you move from part to part inside Spain, the culture, the language, the f everything changes a lot. So life in Andalusia in the south and life in Galicia in the north is very different. And what Franco was trying to do is, is beat that out of Spain, especially in places like Catalonia, especially in places like Valencia, where we're going to go, and especially up in Basque country, and make them less locally and more like Madrid. Make, make Spain a nation state, rather than the kind of bits and pieces, which it still is today, by the way. Um, if you go to Barcelona, they still speak Catalan. They, they prefer not to speak Spanish to you. Um, but the, one of the reasons Guernica is targeted is that it is the capital of Basque country. And if you go there today, there is a tree. Believe it or not, there's this very valuable tree uh, in Guernica, which is where Basque democracy was created long before there was a Spanish state. And they have a beautiful, right next to the tree, this beautiful, they don't call it a parliament, but it's a, it's a, kind, of, it's a kind of parliament, a Basque kind of parliament. So by targeting Guernica, he's not only targeting his military enemies, he's targeting the very idea that you can be Basque and Spanish, which is what he's trying to beat out of Spain. So my, my closest friends from graduate school were from Barcelona. They're Catalans. They speak Catalan. They, everything they do, they do because that's not how it's done in Madrid, right? <laughs> even to this day. And I made a mistake when I told my friend Montserrat uh, that I had enjoyed both my time in Madrid and my time in Barcelona. And her answer to me was, that's not possible. <laughs> right? you, you, you pick one or the other. Um, it's like that Pulp Fiction line where Uma Thurman says to John Travolta, you're either a Beatles guy or an Elvis guy, right? You're either a Barcelona guy or you're a Madrid guy. Uh, and if you know this, even the soccer rivalry between them is, is intense. Um, so, and there's still a movement for Catalan independence today. There's still a desire among people in Barcelona to separate from Spain. Um, so what Franco's doing by targeting Guernica is, again, targeting that idea that you can have a, a, an, an, an identification about yourself that runs against what Franco himself wants Spain to be. So all of these things are coming together in Spain, and it is, as we now know, a very much a preview of the ideological war that the Second World War will become. Um, and it's, in my mind, that transition from what we think of as kind of the First World War nation-state war to the Second World War ideological war. And the crazy thing is, we have the records of the Luftwaffe, and they didn't intend to do a bomber Harris type of annihilation bombing. Uh, as Rich said, it was strategic bombing. Balboa is near here, and that's a city that Mike was talking about. You know, it was the center of Basque culture and had to be taken, and it's much more important than Guernica. But Guernica's on the way to Bilbao. And refugees coming out of there are going through that town, and 
reinforcements, Republicans are coming up through it. And the day that they struck the town, um, they were disappointed that it had burned entirely. Um, they wanted the road net knocked out. It was actually inaugurated as a tactical mission to go after a transportation net. Um, what made it so horrific was that most of the men in the community were off fighting the fascists and fighting for Bosque independence because ultimately that's where the Bosque, like the Catalans, were going. And uh, it was a town of old men, women, and children. Since we're doing a buffet this morning, uh, let me toss in this dish. Uh, one of the other things we get from the Spanish Civil War is the term fifth columnist, which is going to be extremely important throughout the rest of uh, the Second World War. Uh, basically what happens is that a, uh, one of Franco's generals is being interviewed by some correspondents as the, uh, as the uh, nationalists are closing in on Madrid, and he makes the famous statement that, well, we, we have four military columns closing in on Madrid, but ultimately the city will really fall to a fifth column of basically Franco sympathizers within Madrid. And that phrase, fifth columnist, takes off and becomes a catchword that everyone in that era is going to recognize. It becomes symbolic of the enemy within, the traitor within. And this idea is going to unfortunately affect not only uh, the attitude towards uh, fascists and their sympathizers in Europe, this also be become, becomes widely associated with the notion that not only are those nations susceptible, but the British and the Americans, and particularly in the US, the idea of fifth columnists takes hold in the Roosevelt administration big time from the president on down. It plays no small role in the internment of the Japanese Americans. It uh, drives the administration to do a number of uh, things that were clearly illegal in terms of wiretapping and other activities against groups that were uh, non-interventionist, isolationist, uh, many of whom were by no means sympathetic exactly to the fascists, but were simply opposed to American intervention in a war that they believed was going to be rerun in World War I, which is a, a futile struggle which will not produce an enduring peace. And there is a long trail from what happens in that interview in Madrid all the way through the Second World War. And something you need to bear in mind about it, one of the other residuals of the Spanish Civil War. That, that's a terrific point. I mean, Hemingway fed that uh, myth uh, by writing a play called The Fifth Column while he was in Madrid. And in the play, there are fifth columnists. And uh, it was believed. And uh, General Mola was a general that was coming on in Madrid. He, um, and that intent, as you can imagine, that intensifies we talk about these divisions inside even the Republic that intensifies these divisions. It's like the witch hunts of Salem. Who are they? And so now these people are arguing and fighting among themselves and, and, and executing one another. Uh, so it leads to further chaos inside the Republican rank and did no disservice to the revolution that he was supporting, the counter-revolution he was supporting. Because if, yeah, you know, one of the catch uh, things about the fifth column says, beware of the nuns wearing combat boots. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, you, you, you passed over Guernica's uh, um, you, you sort of passed over Guernica's just kind of a way station on the way to bigger things. Don't you think that at the time, I mean, your map there is very telling. It starts out with uh, Franco down in Spanish Morocco and all the way up there. How many people in the United States cared about Spain except for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade? You know, but Guernica was a propaganda coup for right. the Western yeah, powers right, right. because it showed a bunch of Nazi airplanes bombing a helpless population. And that's kind of the first time they saw that because it happens before the Battle of Britain. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of the thing that sort of sets the tone, probably in a lot of people in the, the Western Hemisphere that had no inkling of, oh yeah, they're Europe, they're pissing around with each other again. But the bottom line is, Guernica set a no stamp doubt. on it. Yeah. And, it. And that's something that I, I think probably changes a lot of perceptions. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the, the book that, that Don mentioned, the George Orwell book, which I, I agree with Don, I think it's one of the best books written in the 20th century war, 
Orwell has a line in there where he said, look, I didn't care about Spain, right? I knew that Spain's best men were gonna get killed or put in jail. What mattered to me was that the fascists were triumphant everywhere and somebody had to beat them, right? And somebody had to teach them a lesson. And the other thing about this map that I was just thinking as we were just up here talking, the purple area are Extremadura, Leon, Castile. These are the Castilian, these are the Spanish areas of Spain, right? So there's a, there's a way you can look at the Spanish Civil War kind of militarily. There's another way in which you look at it ethnographically, right? It, it really is, a, 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 so you know, when, when Orwell and Hemingway and others talk about the anarchists, what many of those people mean is they want government devolved to the local level as much as possible so that they're not answering from Madrid. They're answering from their, their local regions. But on the propaganda value of, of, of Guernica, you're 100% you're right. Yeah, the, one of the readings I handed out, I think you'll get that soon, Hemingway wrote a short piece on Stuka dive bomber. Well, it shows you how pervasive the myth was. The Stuka dive bomber wasn't involved at Guernica. Uh, they bombed you know, levelly, And uh, um, there was strafing the next day. The, uh, they sent in uh, Fappels and then, you know, early editions of, Mustang, of uh, Messerschmitts to do the uh, strafing of the, those who escaped to the field and things like that. But that plane becomes the symbol of German terror bombing because it had a siren on it. And when it dove, the siren screeched like that. That's the plane that mowed down civilians escaping from Paris on the way to Marseille, diving into ditches and things like that. But there were, baby carriages and whatnot. It became the symbol of what Germany stood for, terror bombing. Um, I, I didn't think Rich passed over that. I thought he made some really good points about how widespread this was, this, this idea of terror bombing was. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you raised the question about why Franco did not allow Hitler to, to pass through Spain. Uh, and you all pointed out how balkanized uh, well, Spain is still today, particularly in the north. Um, and uh, you anticipated the question I was going to have about how balkanized the, the Civil War was, you know, at least its role in that. But if you fast forward to just to the end of the Spanish Civil War, and Franco, I assume, probably had not fully established control over the whole country. So you're about to invite, you would be in, net inviting fascist Germans to pass through, and if you go back to the last map, basically what is Catalonia and the Basque regions. The two areas that it, 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 exactly it's the same situation uh, in God bless us Ukraine and um, where there's a lot of division <laughs> a lot of division and most of those sores that haven't become scabs yet you know broke out in the 30s and 40s but they, they, they live Eastern European I come from an Eastern European family despite the last name and they don't forget <laughs> they don't forget but uh, yeah, he had to worry about that. Uh, he, had, he had just beaten down a revolution, as it were. Uh, the formation of the Popular Front, as it was called, it was formed in 1936, was a revolution for Spain. When going from a monarchy, and an authoritarian monarchy run by the military and the Catholic Church, to something very different, um, where women have the right to vote, they're closing Catholic schools, secular, trying to secularize the society, modernize the country, uh, aid to the peasantry, uh, land ownership for the poor, all those sorts of things are wildly, uh, wild, crazy, anarchist, communist ideas to Franco, the generals, and the church. And uh, when you went into it, it's a very religious country. When you go to those churches on Sunday, it mattered what that man up at the pulpit was preaching. Yeah. So you don't want to reignite, it's a great observation, you don't want to reignite that. Well, regardless of whether the uh, um, you know everything was shut off with the J Japanese and the Germans, isn't there another issue about North Africa? I mean, that's a breadbasket dating back to the Roman times. That's a supply straight to the if if Europe bogs down, wouldn't that be essential to feed the troops? Yeah, there's no question. It's also essential to feeding France, which which is on starvation rations because the Germans take everything they possibly can out of occupied and unoccupied France. Uh, one of the conditions of the armistice is that France has to pay for its own occupation. It has to pay the Germans to occupy them. So uh, they pay that in wheat, in, in food. So the, the critical issue is when the United States is sending food into North Africa, 
we have to make absolutely sure that that food is going to stay in North Africa, that it's not going to be retransported and, and sent into France where the Germans will just take it away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, food, economic warfare and food warfare is a, is a critical part of all of this. Gibraltar, two centuries before the birth of Christ, is founded as a Roman port and a Roman military garrison to protect the Roman granary in North Africa. By the way, oil the same way. The Americans are happy to ship oil to North Africa if it'll keep North Africans alive, and you know this is coming by charity from the U.S., but not if that oil is going to end up in Vichy and then from there end up in Germany. At what point did uh, Picasso paint Guernica? Paris and sorry. Yeah. Well, he, he got word. He got word. Word soon. After yeah, well, the British quickly. reporter that covered um, the British reporter that covered the bombing, and Steers, the first guy to you know to report it publicly in in, in the New York Times. He took the Times piece that he wrote, the draft of it, to to uh, Picasso in Paris, and Picasso began painting. You know. Um, his, his, uh, his oil paint uh, canvas immediately, immediately. And, uh, and, he, and he did it rather quickly too. It's in the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid today. If you get to see it, it's it's spectacular. Yeah, it's not at the Prado anymore. No, it's at the, it's at the Reina Sofia. On the, on the subject of food, one of the very interesting aspects about the war that transpires in the Mediterranean and the Balkans is that uh, after Greece is occupied by the Germans in 1941, the Greeks are very shortly facing uh, starvation, famine. And uh, Churchill is insistent that the blockade of Europe, uh, blockade of any area controlled by the Nazis be maintained, but eventually the prospect of huge numbers of Greeks dying eventually drives him to agree in a very unusual set of circumstances. Uh, with the Germans to provide that neutral ships will be carrying grain and food into Greece during World War II. Uh, and this is an absolutely extraordinary event in all of World War II in terms of the Germans cooperating with something to prevent the shipment of food. Now, as Churchill fears, the Germans are going to exploit this. Not so much they take it back to Germany, but they, the way they delve it out in Greece is designed to sub, uh, you know, subdue guerrilla movements and keep the food away from people supporting the guerrillas. <laughs> But this is one fairly uh, unusual and obviously very humanitarian uh, uh, episode of World War II that usually gets overlooked. Yeah, and one reason that, go back to Gibraltar point, about the rippling effect of holding on, the British holding on to Gibraltar, um, not having to fight a German invasion even, is that um, Malta survives, for example, because the, the, the fleets that are assembled, the convoys that are assembled at Gibraltar, gigantic convoys, uh, occupying four and five square miles of water in the Mediterranean, bring in planes, pilots, oil, to a parched, hungry country, Malta, and allow Malta to survive. And, uh, allow, and from Malta, you know, it's a refitting and refueling spot to, for the planes and supplies going to the Suez Canal. And uh, um, Rich, maybe you can explain too why the Germans were in such difficult straits because of problems of supply in the Mediterranean. Right. Rommel especially. Right. This, this, uh, this leads actually to a, a larger issue, and I think it's a fascinating issue about the Mediterranean War. This, uh, the Battle of the Atlantic and the struggle in the Mediterranean, particularly between 1940 and 1943, uh, we now know we're particularly marked by this sort of festival of code breaking and code compromises, which is the backstory on an uh, enormous amount of what happens in this theater during the war. On the Allied side, the British, of course, break into the, you know, the Enigma electromechanical cipher device, um, actually during the Battle of France. Uh, they begin reading uh, first Luftwaffe codes, and these are helpful because the Luftwaffe cooperates with the Wehrmacht, the German ground forces, and also with the German Navy, so it gives insight to that. Then they break eventually into the German Army and, and some uh, German Navy codes at times, so they have great problems with the German Navy. Uh, the British are also enormously a uh, benefit from the fact that the Italian Navy uh, starts the war using a book code, uh, a traditional type, 
but they have a very clever one in its cipher system. The British are having fits trying to break, break it. And the Germans come to the Italian Navy and say, well, you know that book code, that's old fashioned, that's not secure. You need to use one of these modern electromechanical cipher machines. And so the Italian Navy adopts what the British call the C38M machine, which they break like that. <laughs> and suddenly they're reading all this stuff about uh, the traffic. The problem with all this tremendous intelligence, because they Walter lies astride that supply route to the Italian and the German forces in North Africa. The problem is they have all this great intelligence, but to exploit it, they have to be able to use sea, land, sea, air, and submarine forces from Malta. But they have tremendous difficulty supporting Malta because it's being bombed to hell by the Germans and the Italians. And so this whole period from 40 to 40 to late 42. Malta, at various stages, is almost neutralized. And in other phases, is able to support air and sea forces and submarine forces that can interdict German supplies. So there's this up and down pattern of when supplies are flowing to the Italian-German uh, forces in North Africa. And between 1940 and the end of 1942, the Italian Navy actually does a much better job of getting supplies to North Africa than you might think. When you do the percentages, they are very successful through that period. Then they tail off in 1943. Meanwhile, what, what's going on on the, uh, Ger uh, the uh, German uh, uh, side, uh, the German B-9s, uh, the uh, German Navy intelligence, they've broken not only the British convoy code, but also Royal Navy code. So the Germans are also reading all kinds of traffic with respect to uh, naval movements in the Mediterranean. There's a massive British history of intelligence in World War II, and now you read that, you realize that there's this innumerable events that occurred in the Mediterranean between 40 and, and 43, in which the trigger is ultra-intelligence from over here. Now, the other thing that happens is General Erwin Rommel, the famous Desert Fox, right, this wily German field marshal who's a super soldier, whatever. We now know that he was in no small way aided by the fact that uh, the Italians have uh, stolen a, a copy of the American uh, black code the US State Department uses, which was not a great code to begin with. The Germans had broken independently, but they don't tell the Italians. And the US military attache in, uh, in Cairo, Bonner Fellers from late 1941, uh, is very diligent and, and compiles every day a detailed report about what the British are up to and the dispositions of their forces. So. Every day, uh, they break uh, uh, Feller's uh, messages within about three hours, and it's in Rommel's hands, so he knows exactly where all the British forces are the night before. And on top of that, Rommel has a detachment of the 6th 21st Signal Battalion, headed by a huffman named Alfred Simon, and they have all these uh, uh, radar receivers, and they've been monitoring British tactical uh, communications, and the British are incredibly insecure on their uh, communications by uh, voice radio. And so Rommel has not only the starting point from the day before, but then C-bomb's outfit is giving him a, a day, hour by hour, almost minute by minute, what the British are up to. Uh, and Bonnerfellers also helpfully provides a disposition of the British defensive position at Gazala. And then he tells Rommel, uh, Rommel reads a message from uh, uh, Fellers, who's a very uh, Anglophobe, uh, in June 24th, 1942, when Rommel has been driving on um, from Gazala towards uh, the Suez. And Bonnefellow sends a message saying that the British have been decisively defeated, and I think he, uh, Rommel can take the Nile Delta. Now, we don't know for sure that that's the ultimate trigger for Rommel's drive. Rommel might have done that anyway, but it sure uh, must incite him to drive even further and also cancel the operation to take Malta at that time. So, this is a really critical aspect about the war in the Mediterranean. And it is after those convoys finally get to, especially a convoy called Pedestal in August 1942, that gets Malta back resupplied and able to interdict, interdict uh, uh, the supplies region to the Italian-German forces in North Africa. That's where the big tailspin comes of the uh, Rommel and the Africa Corps. It's a lot easier to hit a curveball when you know it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, uh, this is more of a, yeah, instead of a question, more of an observation. Your uh, buffet of ideas, and, and, and as, you, as you approach this, is currently going on in modern times, and everything that you have covered is currently be tracked can be tracked now. The uh, people, the players are different, different countries from different areas, but the ideology that's being pushed 
not only in the Americas, but around the world, are also in line with what exactly seems to have gone on in the time period that you guys are currently Well, what Mike about. talked about, the um, creating one country, one language, I mean, this is Putin's idea uh, for Ukraine. I mean, he introduced the idea to Russify Ukraine and to eliminate Ukrainian language eventually, to cut down the teaching of Ukrainian history in the schools, uh, erase the traditions and bring them into the, not the Soviet Union, but the, the old Rus, the, the Russian homeland, you know. This is the hardest thing about being an historian, watching it play back in front of your eyes again and again and again. And I just wrote a blog for the World War One Museum talking about, this is the 1914 script just going again and again and again. And you kind of, you know, so my job at the Army War College is to try to get officers to think this way. That, that this, this has happened before. You can look back and, and actually learn a lot if you're willing to if you're willing to look backward, you'll be able to see better when you look forward. But most people don't think that way. And as an historian, we just sit there. I don't think there's any political scientists in the room, but we just shake our heads at political scientists that have these grand theories and it's like, no, we know we know where this movie is going. To borrow Hem Don's metaphor. Hemingway takes his first pu the pu first public and last public stance, political stance of his life. Spain. It's very unusual for Hemingway to go there to do a film called The Spanish Earth, to come back to the United States, to visit the White House, premiere the film there. Why? To mobilize aid and to get brigaders, American brigaders, into Spain and to get the United States to support the Republicans against the fascists. Um, forget about how you feel about anarchists and communists. The, it's the enemy that you're worried about. It, it, you know, it, it, yeah, it's Orwell who, after, after Homage to Catalonia, what's the next book? 1984. Which is about fascism and communism. You know, one state. Okay. To get back a little bit into the weeds, can you go back to the map of all of North Africa and the Med? Gibraltar is obviously considered a linchpin. What, at this particular point in time, as we're rolling through from our visit to Gibraltar, going past the Torch region, in this period in time before Lynn Lease has probably kicked in so they don't have the extra destroyers, what's the relative balance of power between the naval forces of the UK, the Free French, the Italian fleet up in Italy, because the Germans don't have much of a fleet except for submarines. So what were they most concerned about with these convoys and stuff, is it just the U-boats or? So the, the Free French doesn't have much of a don't have much of a navy. What they have, they actually send to two islands off the coast of Newfoundland, Saint Pierre and Miquelon, on Christmas 1941, and infuriate the American Secretary of State to the point that he almost resigns. De Gaulle sends two ships, I think a submarine and two small ships, and says these are now free. These are now ours, um, and Hull's furious. He actually says it's a violation of the Monroe Doctrine. He, he goes insane. He goes ballistic. Um, so there's not much of a fleet for the for the Free French at this point. It will eventually, what remains of it by 43, uh, will come over to the French side. So uh, the key the key threat in the Med to Allied communications, you're right, is largely Italian ships. Although there are some Germans operating in here. I don't know the exact balance of it. Uh, well, they also have submarines in there too. I mean, like you said, yeah, in the spring of uh, the fall of 41. Um, Admiral Donitz is in charge of the U-boat fleet, and Radar is in charge of the German Navy. Radar makes a pivotal decision. Um, he's been hammering uh, cargo convoys going from the United States to England. He pulls back on Radar's orders and places dozens of submarines in the Mediterranean. Uh, Donitz opposes this. He says the, the big prize is, is the Atlantic and England. But the Germans sub put, put in five dozen submarines eventually into the Med. It was a death trap for them. None of those five dozen Italian submarines ever returned, ever got out of the Mediterranean. Um, the difficulty was, if you've seen Das Boot, the film, um, where the German submarine comes into the Mediterranean, uh, docks in Spain, and gets hammered uh, by, British, uh, by British Spitfires. Yeah, yeah, they're at a Spanish port and uh, on the west coast of Spain, on the east coast of Spain. And um, that's, yeah, 
that, that, that was the great, and then we started to put together, uh, we, we learned to use liberator bombers, this gets off the point, but and to create 100 killer teams, so it's a death trap in that Mediterranean. Plus, it's hard to get out. The, the currents, uh, the, the, you know, it's deep and it's narrow. Uh, that's bad. Uh, Chesapeake Bay is like that, deep and, and, and narrow. Uh, but anyway, off the point. Um, the uh, currents in there are tough. So you get rocketed in from the Atlantic into the Med, almost catapulted in there. And it's extremely, they had to submerge to go out. And the currents are really rough, really rough. So uh, a lot of um, German submarines, U-boats, are, are killed, if you will, in, in, you know, coming out of the channel. You know. So let me, uh, let me touch on the struggle in the Mediterranean, which is, which is the arena of the greatest gore and glory of the Royal Navy during World War II. When uh, France falls and the world is upset, the British basically have to withdraw their naval power from the Far East. And they agree, the British cabinet in August 1940 agrees that besides defending uh, England, the home islands, uh, they will make their major effort in the Mediterranean. And they establish, as we've talked about, Force H at Gibraltar, and then there's the main Mediterranean fleet, which is at Alexander under uh, Andrew Cunningham, one of the greatest British admirals ever. They're confronted with the fact uh, when they establish that fleet that the Italians by, on paper, outnumber them. and. Not only that, the Italian Navy also has several new, very modern battleships, and uh, Cunningham has only some refitted World War I uh, battleships. The Italian Navy ultimately, however, is going to be severely restrained by its lack of fuel. And the larger the ship, the more fuel you need, the less you can use it. And that's eventually going to curtail and sharply curb all actions of the Italian Navy uh, after the late 1942 period. And before that, there are periods when they have fuel and they don't have fuel. So what really is driving what's going on in the Mediterranean? It's air power. Uh, the British learned uh, very painfully during the campaign in Greece and then at Crete in uh, 1941, early 1941 to May 1941. That's where the British fleet gets hammered uh, by, principally by Stuka and also uh, Junkers' uh, 88 dive bombers uh, for which the British have not prepared. Uh, the British Navy never develops a uh, really adequate uh, medium uh, caliber anti-aircraft gun, and uh, they are they had a weapon they called the pom pom, a 40 millimeter weapon, which would have been extremely effective in the 1920s. By the 1940s, uh, it doesn't have the velocity and the range it needs to be as effective against uh, uh, dive bombs. They don't have that many of them. So the British suffer uh, tremendous losses of their cruisers and destroyers in, in the Mediterranean almost uh, very dominantly to air power, controls uh, the ability of the British fleet to operate in the central Mediterranean. Uh, the British also uh, send a lot of submarines to the Mediterranean, and that's where most of the submarines that the British are gonna lose in World War II are going to be lost. And they're mainly, uh, mainly being based out of Malta, uh, trying to intercept those uh, reinforcement convoys going across to uh, the Italian, Italian German army in North Africa. Uh, the U.S. is not involved in this in any way until uh, 1942, uh, and at that point, uh, some of what the U.S. does is not directly send our ships into the Mediterranean, but we relieve British ships in the home fleet so they can release ships from the home fleet to go reinforce the Mediterranean. Uh, when we went in the Battle of Midway, we permit the British to take two aircraft carriers and use them for this pedestal convoy, which relieves Malta, the interconnection of all the war or whatever here is again illustrated by that. But that's really what dominates in the, in the Mediterranean. As I said, it, when the British are able to operate effectively out of Malta with their air power, and their service ships, and their submarines, that's when uh, Rommel's uh, supplies and the, the Italian supplies uh, go down. And that's, of course, just before El Alamein, that's when uh, the combination of the code breaking and the sea power, the air power, whatever, they start sinking all these uh, tankers trying to bring fuel to the uh, Africa Corps. And the British then, when Rommel finally decides he has to abandon El Alamein, he sends a message saying the, basic, the fundamental reason is lack of fuel. And that's because of the effectiveness of Malta. But the British Navy, uh, which loses something around 70 plus thousand uh, men in World War II, uh, most of them are gonna die in the Mediterranean. Rich, you know better than to use the word air power on me. I, I leave to it. Uh, I want to make one other point about Gibraltar. Uh, 
Um, you mentioned 42 when strategic bombing, United States style strategic bombing begins in Europe. And we start to lose a lot of bombers, okay? The 8th Air Force flying out of England, uh, as you might know, lost 26,000 men killed and 36,000 um, badly injured or prisoners of war. Um, that's more men, 20, 26,000 in the Marine Corps lost from Guadalcanal to Okinawa, the entire Pacific War. So these airmen that survived and went, were downed in places like Belgium, um, which is under Nazi, you know, under the Nazi heel, were spirited to safety by, largely by women who um, were um, called post-women or post-men, if, if you were a man on this thing. And they created lines, one of the most famous escape lines was called the Comet Line. And it ran from Belgium all the way down to Gibraltar. And a young British woman, 19 years old, named Dee Dee, nicknamed Dee Dee, ran one of the, you know, established the Comet Line. Uh, later on, when uh, it was temporarily stopped, her father took it over and he was captured and killed. She was eventually captured and sent to a, uh, Ravensbrück, a prisoner of war, excuse me, a concentration camp, survived the experience and after the war became a nurse in a leper colony. But she would take these airmen, bring them into her house. And um, I know the woman who lived next door, who I interviewed for my book, uh, she's still alive and lives down in Savannah, Georgia. And she said, we'd bring the airmen in, we'd give them boots, peasant boots, clothing, things like that, and make sure they, when they were going to go out and uh, be escorted by DD, and she personally escorted over 60 men down to Gibraltar. She went down through Paris, down to the uh, foothills of the Pyrenees, hired boss guides to take them across the Pyrenees. She walked with them across the Pyrenees into semi-neutral Spain. And if they could get passage through, uh, Chuck Yeager did this, you know, when he was shot down, uh, make it to Gibraltar and then back to England. And of course, they could never fly again because they might disclose under torture the existence of the uh, of the comet line, but it was uh, it spirited about 1,300 downed airmen, British and American, through there. And it's interesting you're talking to the women who ran these houses at risk of life. Many of them were put in concentration camps, as I mentioned, and some of them wound up at Auschwitz. But she'd tell the boys, "Don't smoke this way. Smoke the European way. When you walk, put the change in your pocket." She said, "GIs, the flyers." love to jingle change in their pockets. Don't dare do that. Don't dare do that. And to try to merge, uh, purge these, these old habits out of them. Never ask a question. Uh, never look anybody in the face, et cetera, et cetera. But through this process of indoctrination, rehousing them, reclothing them, things, things, patching them up if they, went to, you know, if they needed help for the doctor, things like that, and then personally walking them and taking them by train the rest of the way. Must have been terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Could you position us uh, time-wise with the British uh, and their efforts with the Vichy French in Syria? I'm, I'm, I'm Jesus. <laughs> because uh, the time, they actually were fighting, as I understand, the, uh, yeah. the yeah. Vichy French. That's the problem. This isn't oh complicated enough. You know. oh, Syria boy. into this. Uh, How about Scranton? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're coming up on lunch, so quickly. Um, there is an anti-British revolt in Iraq in the spring of 1942, something called the Golden Square Movement. Um, there's a wonderfully interesting British woman named Frida Stark who was there and kept a diary about it, which is, she traveled all over the Middle East. She's fascinating. In order for the Germans to support the Golden Square movement, they needed access to Vichy French controlled bases in what we now call Syria and Lebanon. So they negotiated with Darlan, who agreed for almost nothing in return to give them access to those two places, uh, to air bases. A free French column, uh, commanded by a man named General uh, Castre, uh, took Syria and Lebanon away from Vichy, so the Germans could not do that. Then General Castle and another general, General Georges, uh, made the decision that after all of this that had gone on, 
the French could not simply reimpose the French Empire on the Syrians and the Lebanese, both because they wouldn't stand for it and because technically those were mandates after the First World War. So France technically governed them as Britain governed Palestine, not as part of the empire, but in the name of the League of Nations, which is now gone, but at any rate. So General George and General Kassler uh, make sure that the Nazis and Germans can't use those air bases in order to support the anti-British movement in Iraq. But they also say, at the end of this, Syria and Lebanon will become independent countries, which drives that man into a fury. Because the only thing that de Gaulle shares with Vichy is that they both believe the French Empire should remain intact. So um, your, your question is an excellent one. Um, if I keep talking about the importance of that, we'll go on here for a very long time. But That's be what we worry about. <laughs> because the Free French have Syria and Lebanon, this anti-British uh, movement in Iraq cannot succeed. Then Churchill then orders the creation of a force in Palestine that marches through Palestine, through what was then called Transjordan, and then into Iraq, establishing British control and authority all the way across. Uh, that, of course, has echoes all the way down to 1958 in the Iraqi coup, and all the way down to what the United States does in 2003, 1990 and 2003 in its two invasions. Again, we think like historians, which means everything is connected to everything. One, and a key British officer in that effort that Churchill authorizes is William Slim, who will then go on to become the commander of the British 14th Army in Burma. So now we're in Burma. Are you happy? <laughs> I, I believe Slim was in Ethiopia, too. Yeah, right, well, right. As, as we approach 12, I think I'll bring this to a conclusion. Uh, bring it full circle with this. We're headed to Valencia, right? Um, Valencia, beautiful city. It was the capital for a year when Spain was, uh, excuse me, when Madrid, Madrid was under siege for three years during the war. It never fell until the very end of the war when Barcelona fell. Um, and the capital of the Republic was in Valencia for an entire year. When um, Hemingway and Martha Gellhorn came into Spain, they went to Valencia first. Um, when Hemingway wrote The Sun Also Rises, uh, in, began in Valencia, coming from the San Fermín's Festival in Pamplona, down into Valencia, stayed there and loved the city. Uh, being the capital of the Republican forces for a year, it was bombed 346 times. The most heavily bombed cities you know, in, like, in, in Western Europe. But it's beautifully restored. It's a magnificent city, one of the most beautiful cities in Spain, very modern. And uh, it has a pulse to it, it has tremendous energy. It's a great place, and a uh, great place to go next. Thank you. What did?